On today's episode of Locked On Oilers, a massive win against the Islanders, the 11-7 method, and the beast of the week. All that and much more on today's episode of Locked On Oilers. Your Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On Oilers Podcast. I'm your host and former Oilers game day producer Brett Holden. As mentioned on today's episode, we're going to start off with that massive win for the Edmonton Oilers over the New York Islanders at home at Rogers Place. Snapping that five-game losing streak on home ice. That is big. We'll start off with that in just a second. But also on today's episode, we're going to talk about the 11-7 method as it made its return to the Edmonton and Oilers last night in that win. So what makes it so effective for the Oilers? We'll talk about that a little later and to wrap up today's episode, the beast of the week as this one is a fan favorite. Could have been last week, but this guy finally is getting the love he deserves, and we'll talk about him a little later on as well. Thank you so much for making Locked On Oilers your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you find your podcast. Alrighty, let's get into the massive 4-2 win for the Edmonton Oilers over the New York Islanders last night as the Oilers got out to a 1-0 lead in the first period, then got to a 2 and actually not even in the first, well they did score in the first period, but they did go into the break with a 2 goal lead, scoring the first 2 goals, one of them 2 coming shorthanded for the Edmonton Oilers. Both goals in the first period coming on the special teams. A power play goal for Leon Dreisaitl, a shorthanded goal for Kyler Yamamoto. His third goal of the year, which was big, especially considering yesterday's ta- rangent, or rangent, tangent, rant, whatever you want to call it. Uh, big goal for Kyler Yamamoto as uh, the Oilers get depth scoring that they so desperately needed. Connor McDavid getting two assists in that one. He has 500 assists in his career. What? A, and that was the big thing. You knew McDavid, you watched him last night and you saw maybe not necessarily the juice that you always see in him. Not in the juice, but you didn't see that spectacular sparkle that he always has in every game. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl, however, certainly had that, and you saw it in this game. A golden assist for Dreisaitl snapping a quiet, I believe it was a seven-game goalless streak for Leon Dreisaitl getting some uh, some assists, excuse me, in that. Plus, he did get injured and is coming back from injury, but also getting his 400th assist in that game as well. In the same game, 500 assists for Connor McDavid. 400 assists for Leon Dreisaitl. A milestone game for the Oilers, but a lot of people have this game as the best game for the Edmonton Oilers so far this year. And that is really complimented by the first period that they had against the Islanders. for I believe it was like three minutes left in the first period. The Edmonton Oilers held the New York Islanders to two shots. Two shots. At one point, the Oilers were out shooting the Islanders 15 to 2 in the first period. Probably, actually, I'm not even going to say probably. It was the Edmonton Oilers' best period, uh, for a uh, best first period. It wasn't their best period as they did have that one period with like 27 shots or 20 shots or whatever it was. Um, but it was their fir- best first period of the year. They realized when the game started, uh, they 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 came out there. They were hitting. They were physical. Yes, they were out hit in the game, uh, but uh, especially well. To be fair, though, the Islanders did have the first couple minutes of the game, and then after that, the Edmonton Oilers just went to work. Great cycle in the offensive zone, leading to multiple penalties taken by the Islanders. They couldn't keep up with the Edmonton Oilers, and that again had a lot to do with their cycle. The Oilers came out, was ready to play, 
and they ran the 11-7. Heading into the game, we had a lot of the conversation about what are the Oilers going to do in this game. We weren't sure about the lineup. We just knew about the top six, really. Other than that, very unclear. The Edmonton Oilers went into the game with the 11-7, which we'll get more into in the second period of today's episode. But I do want to talk about it right now. The Oilers lineup last night went like this. Clean Costin, Connor McDavid, and Kyler Yamamoto, the top line. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Leon Dreisaitl, and uh, Zach Hyman were on the second line. Matthias Janmark, Ryan McLeod, and Yessa Puliarvi made up the third line. And then Dylan Holloway and Derek Ryan were on the fourth line. Darnell Nurse, Cody Ceci, Brett Kulak, Tyson Berry, Philip Broberg, Evan Boone, Bouchard, and then the extra defenseman of Marcus Niemelainen. Now, Marcus Niemelainen did only play uh, three minutes and six seconds in that game. You can sit there and go, ah, so why? I can understand that. It does sound like Warren Fogle was uh, a late scratch due to an injury. James Hamblin did take the uh, warm-up, but it was uh, him and Fogle getting the scratch in the game. Unsure as to how long or the significance of the injury, so uh, we shall see with that. But that does uh, see the Edmonton Oilers win another game in the 11-7. Jack Campbell making 20 saves in the game. And that's an attribution or attributed to Jack Campbell. He played a very strong game, did only have to face 20 shots or 22 shots, excuse me. But that's also an attribution or attributed to the Edmonton Oilers defense. The fact that you're able to only allow, what was it, uh, only a couple of shots in the first period. I'm trying to find uh, a period-by-period shot clock here for this game. But either way, um, this allows, the fact that you allow the New York Islanders, who are a very good away from home team and you got them and prevented them from shooting even presenting anything in the offensive zone and then once they did come back kind of started to sit there and go ah you guys thought we were away scored that first goal and then did score a second goal but it was too little too late as the Edmonton Oilers were able to get for uh the win for two but the ability to shut down the offense or the yeah the offensive production from the opposition is big that it, it was the best game for the Edmonton Oilers in their own end maybe not so much in the offensive zone as I wish I saw maybe a little bit more composure in the offensive zone saw a lot of really good cycling around uh, uh, the offensive zone and 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 putting pucks towards the net but I just want to see a little bit more composure and that that would put this team over the top. The other interesting thing in this game is that the Edmonton Oilers got out hit in this one by a lot. 44 hits for the New York Islanders in this one, 25 for the Edmonton Oilers. I want to see that number go up. Yes, the Oilers do or are missing Evander Kane, uh, who is very good in that sense. Darnell Nurse has 12 hits over the last three games. Clem Costin has 12 hits over the last three games, but you still need to hit more. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Also, 20 blocked shots for the uh, New York Islanders in this one. The final shot tally in this one, however, 38 shots for the Edmonton Oilers, 22 for the New York Islanders. Big game for the Oilers, big win in this one, and they look to improve on their record as they did improve on their record last night, going to 21-17-2, but they look to improve on that record on Saturday as the Colorado Avalanche, the defending Stanley Cup champions, the rematch of the Western Conference Finals from last year, go to Rogers Place for Hockey Night in Canada. What could be better? That is going to be a massive game. 8 o'clock puck drop here at Rogers Place. That's going to be a fun one. I can't wait for that. How do you think that's going to turn out? Do the Oilers run with 11-7? Who, also, who starts? Is it Stuart Skinner? Jack Campbell's had a good uh, a couple weeks as well. Uh, so Or a couple games, I should say. So, 
let me know. Who do you think the Edmonton Oilers run with? Either way, let's talk more about that 11-7 for the Edmonton Oilers. Why is it effective for the Oilers? What really makes the 11-7 work for the Edmonton Oilers? We will talk about that in just a second. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories? Then you gotta try out Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and my goal for the holidays, obviously, is see, I'm a big boy, and it's to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me and you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise that taste, I am a taste guy, I'm very much a taste guy, then man, do I have the thing for you. You gotta try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they are so delicious, you won't think that they're good for you. Perfect for your New Year's resolution. You always give up on your New Year's resolution by the first month anyways because it's not actually not good for you, but it doesn't taste good whatever you're doing that's changing. Built Bar will allow you to follow your New Year's resolution while still tasting good. That's the main thing. Plus, what makes it so good? 100% real chocolate. Yes, real chocolate is going into these Build Bars. Plus, they come in a whole bunch of unbelievably delicious flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie. Oh, that one is so good. And coconut almond. They have so many fantastic flavors. They're coming out with new flavors all the time to make sure you are keeping up with Built Bar. So if they do make one of your favorite flavors, you can go out there and order it. But here's the thing. How many times have we been sending you to Built.com to go and get those uh, uh, brand new Built bars, those brand new Built bar flavors? We don't have to do that anymore. Now, you can just head over to your local Walmart or Sam's Club and get your box of Built bar. Alrighty, let's move on to the 11-7 for the Edmonton Oilers as they did run that 11-7 uh, last night against the New York Islanders as mentioned. And that was something that for some reason didn't really cross many of our minds going into that game. Why did we not think of the 11-7, the thing that was so popular for the Edmonton Oilers last year and at the start of this year as well, weren't able to keep it going because of some of the injuries that they uh, did sustain throughout the season, but they brought it back against the Islanders, and guess what? They get a win. They did it in the playoffs, and guess what? They won. So... Why is it so effective? Well, the first thing is the obvious thing. This allows you to let Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl play more often. You can throw Connor McDavid on a line with Holloway and Ryan, and you can sit there and have an effective line at all times. You can sit there and have Nugent Hopkins uh, and and uh, Hyman play with Dreisaitl or play with Connor McDavid. Or, heck, why not put him with Ryan McLeod? Realistically, the centers in an 11-7 lineup is just pure placeholders. It is more about the wingers in that situation. And when you have the centers that the Edmonton Oilers have... It makes it easier for the coach. It makes it easier for the team to be more flexible and play with anybody. You can get that initial chemistry with two players, a.k.a. those wingers, and let them play together. Then you can insert a guy who can play with basically anybody. Actually, you can insert two guys who can play with basically anybody and Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and make them look like how Patrick Maroon did for the Edmonton Oilers. That is very important for the Edmonton Oilers as they are able to let Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl go out there and play their game while also playing with wingers who maybe need that help with a Connor McDavid or a Leon Dreisaitl, but also play with a set of wingers who have chemistry, who know what each other are doing at all times, that certainly helps the Edmonton Oilers there. The other thing, too, is that obviously it allows for more defensemen in the lineup and it allows for more parity in the uh, Edmonton Oilers' defensive core. The Edmonton Oilers are having issues defensively. It is not a secret. But there's only so many combinations and things you can try before a it just looks desperate and b you're just making a bad thing worse 
we talked about, oh, what happens if you put Broberg and Cece and uh, Nurse and Bouchard together? Fair enough. But now you are doing that naturally without really taking too much ice time from a player here or there. This also allows the Edmonton Oilers, not only defensively, but in the game as well, with their forechecking, with their backchecking, with their play in their own end, with the play in the other end, just ga the game in general. It allows the Edmonton Oilers to be more flexible in a way that doesn't, again, make them look desperate. How often have the Edmonton Oilers been down in games, struggling in games, and then all of a sudden, ah, here comes the blender and tie ratties on the top line with Connor McDavid on it's just it, it's too much sometimes especially and I think that was the demise of a guy like Dave Tippett how often would the Edmonton Oilers go down in in a game and it wouldn't even be like the Oilers were playing bad they're just down in the game and all of a sudden the lines are in a blender and you have no chemistry with the line mate you were just playing with maybe you'll play with a guy twice in the entire game it's not good for a team who, especially at that time with Dave Tippett, were still trying to figure themselves out. Now, with the 11-7, as mentioned, you're not really putting the, the lines in a blender. You're just putting players who have chemistry together, as mentioned with the wingers, with some of the best centers in the world. Not the league, in the world. It's a luxury that basically almost only the Edmonton Oilers are able to have. But it's still a luxury. And Jay Woodcroft uses it well. Yes, Marcus Niemelainen only played three minutes. But it was three minutes when the Edmonton Oilers needed a Marcus Niemelainen on the ice. He was also probably bound by the fact that Warren Fogle was probably a late scratch. Trying to figure out what they were going to do. And he, you only could find so much time and, and put out a team out on the ice. I understand that as well. But Marcus Niemelainen is still an effective defenseman and is still we have seen it, especially since he came back from the AHL, better with the puck, a solid uh, skater. He isn't afraid to hit. Heck, he won the fastest skater for the Edmonton Oilers at the uh, skills competition. He's an effective hockey player. And the fact that you're able to find time for a player like him in a situation where the Edmonton Oilers have struggled, again, defensively in their own end and ending the cycle of the other team, that's important. And that is what the 11-7 brings to the Edmonton Oilers. It, 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 plain and simple. It, it, it allows the Edmonton Oilers to play their best players the most and play the players that they need to in different situations. You aren't bound to these lines. And I realize that, oh, if, you're, if you play a 12-6, you don't always have to play those lines together. That's fair. Uh, you, you don't. But then you s then have to sit there and go, okay, well, if I move Casey Zizekas here and then put Matt Martin here and then, uh, then oh, I have the Aturati. I can put him there too. It, it makes it more difficult for teams to, to, to really move around their lines. For the Oilers, in 11-7, and in the 11-7 in general, as long as you have those players that you can go, okay, you're going to be playing with this guy and this guy however often, you know what you're going to get. And plus, as mentioned, the Edmonton Oilers have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. It's not that hard to realize who those two players are. So, and plus, I haven't even mentioned Ryan McLeod, who's basically Ryan Nugent Hopkins 2.0. Got an assist last night. A very solid player. As, as Jay Woodcroft says, too, a player who can play in all situations, in his own end, in the offensive zone, shorthanded, power play, in the transition. It doesn't matter. So that really helps the Edmonton Oilers, too, because you basically have a, a one, two, three forward uh, center core right there. 
Then on lines that maybe if you, you know what, you can even toss Ryan Nugent Hopkins out there and put McLeod on the wing or throw uh, uh, or move everybody up. And you saw what happened with Holloway. You can then have the flexibility of also playing Ryan Nugent Hopkins in other places. So it's flexible for your centermen. It's flexible for your wingers. It allows your defensemen to get extra help when they need it. And as well, it helps the goaltenders because, hey, you get more defensemen either way. Uh, that is why the 11-7 works for the Edmonton Oilers. What do you think? Do you like the 11-7? Should the Edmonton Oilers keep going with the 11-7? Got their first win at home in five games with the 11-7. Haven't been going with it for a very long time so far this year. And we know how the Edmonton Oilers have been this year. There's been some issues. Except... They've won with the 11-7, so why not keep trying it? I don't know. You let me know. Am I just talking out of the wind here, or is there something to it? Uh, do you like the 11-7? Do you want another forward? I don't know. Either way, let me know. Uh, let's move on to the beast of the week, and this one has become an absolute cult hero in Edmonton, has been elevated in the lineup, and has had a lot of positive things spoken about him in not only the local media, but the national media as well. We will talk about him in just a second. But first, I want to thank you for making Locked On Oilers your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, make sure you tune in to Locked On NHL Prospects, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the NHL draft. Locked On NHL Prospects, available on YouTube and wherever you find your podcast. Couldn't imagine how he has uh, a lot of things to talk about on uh, NHL prospects uh, recently. I don't think they had a major tournament end or something like that. I don't know. I pfft, beats me, but uh, maybe maybe he has something to talk about over there. Beats me. Maybe Reed Schaefer winning a World Juniors. Anyways, let's move on to our beast of the week as uh, this beast has been just an absolute favorite in Edmonton. We're still trying to figure out what his nickname is, but you can go through a plethora of nicknames for this lad as he has went from the fourth line to the third line all the way up to the first line last night for the Edmonton Oilers and our beast of the week is Clem Costin starting off with the Winnipeg game scoring the only goal of that game for the Edmonton Oilers looking like the best Edmonton Oilers honestly I was in the crowd for that game and I have never heard Rogers place cheer for one player so loud other than Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Edmonton loves Clem Costin for good reason, and Edmonton doesn't love players too often, and you don't get loved in Edmonton without doing good things. And that is what uh, Clem Costin has done. Obviously, as mentioned, the goal against Winnipeg, he was upgraded to the top line. In the last three games, I mentioned this earlier today, but in the last three games, 12 hits. Oh my goodness, as my notes go everywhere. 12 hits for Clem Costin over the last three games. First on the Edmonton Oilers. In the, well, tied for first, actually, with uh, Darnell Nurse there. But he is also climbing the hit streak for or the hitting... Uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Leaderboard. That's the word I'm looking for. He is climbing the Edmonton Oilers hitting leaderboard. He is now, I believe, at 74 hits on the year. A very, very solid week for Clem Costin. Also, very good. he does a lot of very subtle things right that especially won't show up on the score sheet but he's drawn two penalties over the last three games he keeps his feet moving and I, I was watching Oilers Nation I forget what show it was but on Oilers Nation today they were mentioning just some of the other things that Clem Costin does especially what he does with the puck when he's on the puck and I've mentioned this as well a couple of times too watch the difference between him with the puck and yes a play RV with the puck play RV wants wants nothing to do with the puck, and that's a player who has little to no confidence right now. Clem Costin has all the confidence in the world, loves the fans, loves the team that he's playing for, which is a, a massive thing for Oilers fans and uh, the Edmonton Oilers in general. 
He is doing so many good things with the puck. His zone entries have been fantastic. They mentioned it on the broadcast that he, the little things that he does is what really separates him from other players. Again, those zone entries, those little passes to Connor McDavid. He's getting himself open. He's moving himself, moving his feet. He is consistently anywhere and everywhere where he needs to be. He's great in his own end. Clean cost and just an absolute steal of a player for the Edmonton Oilers. Plus, as mentioned, he looked great with Connor McDavid. That is the main thing. Connor McDavid. He's playing with Connor McDavid. He even said he's more uh, he was more nervous going into that game playing with Connor McDavid than he was with his first NHL game. He loves it here. That is the biggest thing right now because you don't often get people who love playing in Edmonton. And he sits there and goes, I love the fans more than you love me. Ah, you love this kid. You just love this kid. It's fantastic. The Edmonton Oilers look to improve on uh, their record with Clem the Dream Costin, the beast of the week this week, on the top line against the Colorado Avalanche. Tomorrow night, 8 o'clock puck drop, as that is Hockey Night in Canada, a rematch of the Western Conference Finals against the reigning Stanley Cup champions, the Colorado Avalanche. Can't wait for it. I can't wait to see you next week. I hope you have a wonderful week and a quick congratulations Congratulations to the World Junior Canadian team as the Canadians win in overtime. A beautiful goal by Edmontonian Dylan Gunther, former Sherwood Park Crusader, former Edmonton Oil King, and current Arizona Coyote. Congratulations to those kids. What a tournament we had in the World Juniors. And also want to acknowledge as well, sending the best wishes to DeMar Hamlin's family as DeMar Hamlin was also, uh, it was reported that he is awake. He did talk to his teammates today, wishing all the best to him and his family as that is just, uh, it, it goes beyond sport, obviously. Real lives are, are going on in the world of sports. And it's just beautiful to see that he is able to be speaking, be uh, able to breathe on his own, and just a scary, scary situation. A real reminder of the mortality of sport and why we are here and the importance of what these guys do, not only on the field, on the ice, on the pitch, any sport that you watch, it is a real danger every time they do what they do. So all the best to Damar Hamlin's family and the Buffalo Bills organization, and of course, Damar Hamlin as well. Well, all the best to you this weekend as well as I shall see you on the flip. Hopefully, at the end of Hockey Night in Canada, we can play La Bamba, baby.